morning, everybody. Welcome to all of you, and welcome to anybody watching online. My name is Pete, and uh, and I'm one of the pastors here. And I almost forgot that somehow um, in that line. Happy Thanksgiving to everyone here. Um, it's a unique time of year, I find. Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is this. Uh, it's sort of this. Well, we're going to have a long weekend now, and then we got to make it to Christmas. And there's this, there's this big gap, unless you're American and you, you, know, you celebrate that little American Thanksgiving there. But if you're just Canadian, a true patriot, then you got to get from here to Christmas somehow. And it's right about now that we've went through September and things have got started up again that some of you are realizing, I signed up for way too much stuff we signed our kids up for way too much stuff. Honey, how are we going to do all of these things? What do, it's right about now where you're like, my job is putting so much pressure on me, and you're feeling like, how do I get to Christmas? Maybe some of you are thinking about later on today or perhaps tomorrow, you're going to find yourself around a table with some family members. And you're thinking, forget Christmas. I don't know how I'm going to get through this afternoon. With these people. You're here hiding. You're, you're like, could we have a third service? So I believe. Pastor Pete, let's do it. You're, you're like, you know, so, so some of you are maybe feeling like, I don't know how, given how I feel right now, how I'm ever going to make it there. And maybe mixed in with that is the feeling of like, aren't I supposed to be thriving? Like, whether you're a follower of Jesus or not, there, there can be a feeling that comes into us like, aren't I supposed to be flourishing? Supposed to be full of love and joy and bringing peace into the world? Like, aren't I, isn't that what life is supposed to be like? And instead you feel like, I feel like I'm like barely hanging on. Like maybe, maybe you feel like, like this is, this is you. These are, these are my garbage bags this morning. I just... Grab these from neighbors and things and <laughs> brought them up. But maybe like this image resonates with you. I don't have to say much. I just stand. This is in, the, in my notes. This part says, stand in the garbage bags and look at the people who are resonating with the idea that they know what this feels like. Maybe some of you resonate with this. Like life feels like this. I'm going to make it to Christmas. I'm going to, I can carry all this stuff. I can do it. I can do it. And slowly, it's just, it's just too, too heavy. Maybe, maybe this, maybe this image resonates with you. I'm not standing around it. I'm not holding it up. I'm buried in it. This is surprisingly comfortable. And then he emerged from the garbage. If you feel like any of that resonates with you, then today's sermon is for you. And I've titled today's sermon, Put It Down. And I'm hoping that by the end of today's sermon, you're going to be able to take a deep breath and find a new place from which you can live from that doesn't feel like that. But before we get there, we got to do something that's going to feel a little uncomfortable. All right? And it's not going to be uncomfortable because of anything I'm going to say. It's going to be uncomfortable because of stuff that's written in the Bible. And so if you get upset, just remember, this is Paul that wrote this, not Peter. <laughs> Peter is my, is my saintly name, by the way. Like, Pastor Pete, that's just average guy. But when Pete, Peter is invoked, that's like, then my mother named me Peter. All right? Saint Peter. Okay. What was I talking about? <laughs> uncomfortable. We got to get a little bit uncomfortable. So what we're going to do is we have to prepare. We're going to prepare to read this passage, okay? You can flip to it, turn it on on your device. Don't read it yet, but I want to prepare us to read this by looking at the language that Paul uses in this passage. And it's going to be language that can make us a little bit uncomfortable. And it's language that Paul uses to describe the default human condition. 
So what is the default human condition, according to Paul, according to Christianity? It's this. Dead in transgressions and sins. Already you're like, oh, that's language. I, I use that all the time. I was like, I just, I, I transgressed this morning. I was like, have you transgressed? Oh, that's, we've transgressed, yes. It's language, language like this, dead in transgressions and sins. There are things that we have done that have made us in a state of being dead. Like, could you get any stronger language possibly? Like, I, w- I was thinking that, like, the, the image of the garbage bags, I thought, I thought that's actually watered-down preaching. Because Paul doesn't talk about you're in a garbage, garbage pit. He says you were dead. Dead in transgressions and sins. Following the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. This is a, a euphemism for the Satan or the accuser or the evil one. The default human position is that you are following the ways of the world. If there's the way of God, humans aren't naturally inclined to just go that way. We, we follow the ways of the world. We are by nature disobedient. If we hear rules, we are by nature like, ah, I wanna, I'd rather try my own thing. Can I try my own? I want to try my own, my own thing. We, by nature, want to gratify the cravings of the flesh and follow its desires and thoughts, that, that our body has these impulses. I want to do this. I want to get that. We are, by nature, craving these things. We have these thoughts, and, and we are led by our emotions. And lastly, by nature, deserving of wrath. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. I, told, I was telling one of my sons about this. I'm like, oh, the sermon's going to be heavy. Like, I got this part in. And he goes, Dad, why don't you just play a movie again? <laughs> I'm like, yes, that's what we do. That's what we do. It's great. By nature deserving of wrath. Now, wrath, when you see that word in the Bible, I want you to think of two things. One, God's punishment as a consequence for things that we do. But also the natural consequences for things that we do. So there's kind of like two categories. We live a certain way against God, rebellious, gratifying the the cravings of the flesh, disobedient, dead in transgressions and sins, and that brings and makes us deserving of wrath, which can be God's active punishment, but it can also just be, you did some stupid things and now you're gonna get the natural consequences of those. That's also considered wrath in the form of God hands us over to those consequences. Like sometimes God is almost like a dam protecting us from, oh, you would get, you would get an avalanche just covered by things, but I'm going to protect you. And sometimes his wrath is just like, I got to take away my protection and let you feel these consequences. Can you come into agreement with this as the default human condition. I know it's unfamiliar, unfamiliar to our culture. It's, it's unfamiliar language sometimes even to, to find in church, unfortunately. Can you come into agreement that you are by nature deserving of wrath? Can you get to the place where you would be able to say, yeah, yeah, I know what Paul's talking about. I know what Paul's talking about because there's things, there's things that I do that I don't want to do. Like forget about even like the, the things that God wants me to do. Like forget about those, just my own. There, there's things I want to do and I can't even do them. And then there's other stuff that I want to stop doing. Like, man, I would love to get rid of this one. And yet I can't even, I can't get rid of that. And so Paul would say it this way. So, and so I find that I hate what I do. Does that resonate at all? Like, you, you know what this is like. You know what it's like to feel the helplessness that is experienced here? Like, to see these things around and be like, this one's been with me since as long as I can remember. And this one I've tried my hardest to get rid of, and it keeps coming back. I thought I threw it out the window ten times, and it keeps coming back. 
And so I know what it's like to be controlled by my desires and to feel trapped and helpless in them. And maybe one of the worst places to find yourself is when everybody else around you has no idea that this is how you feel. Everybody else around you is like, you're the golden child. You're the one who's got it all together. If your life's a wreck, none of us have any hope. And yet some of you, that's exactly how you feel. If people knew how I really felt, they would be shocked because my life looks so clean on the outside, but on the inside, I know I got all these problems. I know that I am deserving of wrath. And maybe worst of all, when you realize that this isn't just like a collection of things that you've done, but that slowly they actually kind of like attach themselves to you. And they begin to like identify, like this isn't just a thing I do anymore. This is like actually a part of my identity. This is actually who I am in some weird way. And I got all these things attached to me and they don't feel like they belong. And yet somehow they do identify me. Can you? get to the place where you would agree with Paul that you are by nature deserving of wrath? Can you get to the place where if you imagined yourself standing before a good, holy, perfect, just, righteous God that you would realize I don't belong with him. I am deserving of, I, I have created this. I have embraced this. This is who I've become and I'm stuck here. I am dead in my transgressions and sins. Can you agree with Paul on this? Because if you can't agree on these things, then the rest of the sermon, we might as well not go there. If you can't agree on these things, then there's no use reading the passage. In our culture, there, there's two really popular responses to this sort of picture. One of them, you may have already been thinking. One of them is this. Pete, you're, you're making it so heavy. Like, like it's, so, it's not, like we don't have problems like this. Some of you are thinking, this is the problem with religion. This is the problem with Christianity. It tells people that the default is that you got all this big mess in your life. What we got to do is stop telling people that and tell them they're basically good. You are basically good. And these things, this is just who you are. And everybody's got things like this, and everybody feels a little low sometimes. So stop making it into such a big deal. One, one strategy to this sort of picture is just ignore that there is a problem. And I don't know what to say to that other than if it's true that you have this problem, dead in your transgressions and sins, deserving of wrath, if that's true, then ignoring it won't make it go away. And you can only ignore a problem for so long and it keeps popping up that at some point you got to just give in and say, maybe there's a problem. Maybe this view is true. But a close cousin to there is no problem. Stop telling people there's a problem is, yeah, there's a problem, but it's just small. Like it's a small problem. It's not deserving of wrath. Whoa, my goodness. This language, and it's just, it's just a small thing. It's not a big deal. And when you make that move, now you make God so much lower. Now you make God into a God who looks at all the evil and horrible things that humans have created in the world, and that God looks at it and goes, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. And I suggest to you, nobody wants a God who is like that. It is only from the most privileged position that you could want a God like that. If you have ever experienced the evil and injustice in the world, you do not want a God who looks at it all and just goes, it's not that bad. Oh, pick yourself up. It's going to be fine. Nobody wants that God. 
It's not a problem. It's not that big of a problem. Just ignore it. The other move of what we should do if we can embrace this is, well, just going to have to try harder. Just going to have to try harder. Uh, last time I picked these up, I wasn't strong enough, but I've been watching lots of self-help videos, and I got myself a mentor, and I'm going to just try harder, and I'm going to make a list. That's what I need, more lists. And when I get the list, then I'm going to fix my life up. Try harder. Do more. Get stronger. And maybe you could get to the place where you feel like, I put a lot of this stuff behind me. Like, I got it behind me. And then you'd say, ta-da to God. And even if you could do that, God would still be like, great, but what about all the stuff back there? Who's going to account for all of that? Like, what covers over all of that mess? And that's only if you could get rid of all this. Whereas the truth is, is that you can't get rid of all this. At best, you can... You can turn the faucet down so that it doesn't come through quite as fast, but there's always a trickle. There's always more stuff that like, as much as you're, it's behind me, it's behind me, and then suddenly it's like, oh, there's another one in front of me. There's, another, like they, there's always a trickle. And so you can tell yourself, I'm going to do better, I'm going to try harder, I'm going to be stronger, but that way of living is an endless cycle that will leave you exhausted, wondering, how am I ever going to make it to tomorrow and next week? It can leave you in a place of feeling like, I just wish it would all stop because I've tried trying and it's not working for me. And so that leaves us with what do we do with this? What do we do with this position that we find ourselves in. And from here, now we're ready for the passage. Paul in Ephesians chapter two, writing to Christians, writing to people who have decided to follow Jesus says this, as for you, you were, huh, already? You were, you were there. Paul, are you telling me that I'm not there anymore? It sounds like it. I just need like, I need five words. I got the good news and five words. As for you, you were. You were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were, by nature, deserving of wrath. Before you became followers of Jesus, before you became Christians, you were there, Paul is saying. Which should then evoke the question, perhaps, within you. If you were maybe listening in and being like, so that's what these Christians are all about. What happened to you guys? What happened to you? Like, you'd be over here, and Paul's like, you were here, and you're like, how'd you guys get out of here? They're like, tell, tell me, Paul, how'd you, how'd you get out of here? Paul tells us, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. You were there. Jesus, the Christ, came, died on a cross to pay for all of that stuff to cover the bill for all of that stuff so that you could be saved from it. So that you could be reconciled with God. Well, what do we have to do? What do we have to do to make Jesus do that for us? Nothing. That's what the word grace means. Grace means gift. It is a gift. Why did God do this? Because of his love, of his mercy, of his grace. It is by grace that you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Whoa, Paul. Now we got some movement here. He's not just saying you were here and now you're, you're, now you're here. He's like you have been moved from there to here. And I thought about this all week long. If I would sit in this chair or not. Because sometimes you put a chair on stage like this and you reference it as like God's throne. And people are like, oh, don't sit there. We don't want to see you die in front of us all. 
But the more that I read this, seated us with him in heavenly realms. I'm not saying that like we become mini gods or anything like that. There's teaching like that. I'm not saying that, but, but it, it does say seated with him. And so I just want to sit ever so gently just to illustrate. We are now seated in heavenly realms with Christ. This is, this is mind blowing. We were there and now we're here. And how does that work again? It's just a gift that you receive by trusting in the one who gives it to you. He continues, in order that in the coming ages. So what's after this? We were moved from there to here. Now what's coming next? Well, let me tell you. He might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. He's like, it's going to get even better. This is only the beginning. And then he reasserts this idea, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. It's a gift that you trust in. And then I love how Paul ends this passage in the next verse, because he doesn't end here. He doesn't end with where we often end in Christian language and Christian messages where we go, yeah, you were there and now you're here. Isn't that great? One day we'll all fly away. No, no. He gets us back to our, origi our original created purpose. What were we created to do? To be reflections of who God is in the world. To bring love and joy and peace into the world. To bring the character of God into the world. And that's how Paul ends in the next verse. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus. It's like recreated. You've been recreated now that you are in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This, when you grab hold of this, when you root yourself in this, it is a foundational, it's a fundamental shift in how you see the world. Because usually, how we think, how our culture thinks, how most religions think, is that I am here and I need to do good works to get there. I'm here and I got to try harder, I got to do better so that I can get there, so I can get out of here and get closer to God, get closer to the goal, the good life, whatever that is. And Paul says, flip it around. You begin here. And from here, you do good works. And that is changes everything. You don't have to do good works to get God's love. You get God's love so you can do good works. Just flip it around how we most often see life. I got to do better than God will love me more. No, God loves you. And now from this place, seated with him, do good works. Be who you were created to be. If only we could all root ourselves here, it would change everything, and it would, it would override the feeling of, I'm barely making it. I don't know how I'm going to get to Christmas. There's challenges that come in the way of us living in this place. One challenge is this. I call it, I call it the gold star challenge, because there's days, there's days when I feel like I'm doing pretty good. There's days when I'm like, look at me. Look at me. There's days where I'm like, Jesus, you want me to say, oh, Jesus. Yeah, well, let's go. I'm like, Jesus is like, that was a great sermon. I'm like, I know I really killed that sermon. And he's like, you said stuff I forgot. I know I worked really hard on that. It's great. There's days when you can think that you deserve to be here. Dangerous, dangerous. Because if you think that, then that means that you're just setting yourself up for days when you feel like you don't deserve to be here. Not that we ever deserve to be here, but that we don't get to be here, maybe is a better word. There's days when I feel like, yeah, of course, me and God. But then there's other days where you're here. And what this foundational teaching from Paul gives us is strong language to assure us that even on our worst days, even when we make the same mistakes over and over and over again, we are still invited to be seated with Christ in heavenly realms. 
another challenge that we will face as we try to be rooted in this teaching of saved by grace through faith for good works is that some of these things I want to get rid of, but other things, if I'm honest, like I kind of like this one. Like this is the one that, that I know isn't ultimately helpful for me. I know ultimately isn't good, but in the moment, I, it helps me. It, it, it's kind of like a place I can go to and just get a, get a breath, just, ah, oh, just some. And so, so what I'm really wondering, Jesus, is could I get both? Could I, could I be seated with you in the heavenly realms and just bring this thing that helps me get through the day with me? And if we try to pull this off, what we will find is that you can't be seated in heavenly places with Christ and not have his grace relentlessly coming after you, transforming you. You may be able to say, like, I'm attached to this thing. I need some help. Okay, Jesus, we'll work on that. But as you sit here with him, he's going to be able to put it down. Trust me, you can put it down. Trust me, I am enough. Trust me, your life will be better without this. Trust me. Can you trust him that your life will be better without this thing that you've come to love? A third challenge for us, living in this place, being rooted in this place, is that it can all seem too good to be true. Too, it's too, from there to here, like, man. Which brings me to one of my favorite stories that Jesus tells. It's the parable of the prodigal son. A father who has two sons. And the younger son comes to him and demands his inheritance. Give me, give me my inheritance. And the father gives it to him graciously. And he, and he goes off to Las Vegas and wastes it all in wild living. And when he's wasted all of his money, he finds himself taking care of pigs. And as he takes care of the pigs, he longs to be able to eat what the pigs are eating. He realizes that he is now dead in his transgressions and sins. And he realizes that he is deserving of the consequences that are coming for him. And from this place, he begins to remember what life was like back home. And Jesus, in his parable, tells us what he th is thinking from this place. He thinks to himself, I shall go home to my father. And I'll tell my father, Father, I know that I've sinned against heaven and against you. I know that I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And so, would you make me like one of your hired servants. Those three words hit me in the last couple of weeks. That the highest that this son could imagine, the greatest imagination that he can have for the goodness of his father, that it would be, make me like a servant in your house. If you could just get me out of here, I don't need to go there, so if you could just get me out of here, just make me like here, so I can get one foot in front of the other and get through tomorrow. And I wonder how many of us get caught in that type of thinking. Because you know what's in these bags. It's so real, like if I open one up, like it's like you could fill in the, you know what's inside of these bags. And so the highest that you've ever wished for is like, make me like somebody who's not depressed all the time. Make me like someone who's not constantly afraid and worried and trying to measure up to everybody else around me and worried about what God thinks of me. Just make me like one of those people so I can just live here. That would be so much better than where I come from. Which is why Jesus' parable is so scandalous. Because the father doesn't run to his son and say, good, I'll make you like a servant. You're going to learn your lesson. The father comes out when he sees his son a long way off and he runs to him. And he throws a coat around his shoulders and a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and says, kill the fattened calf. We're going to have a party and celebrate because my son who was dead is alive again. 
He was lost and now he is found. Jesus invites us to hear stories like this and to live our lives from within them, to be rooted in stories like this. This is his invitation. And so what I wanna encourage you to do this week if this is new, if you find yourself like, yeah, I find myself getting trapped there, trying to carry all this stuff, just a very simple prayer for you built off of this passage. Say it when you wake up. Say it at every meal that you eat. Say it before you go to bed. I am saved by grace through faith for good works. I am not going to begin my day trying to do good works so that maybe then I'll get some grace. Maybe then I'll get saved. I will begin my day. Father, I need you. I am helpless. But I believe that you desire to save me as a good gift. All I have to do is trust it. And then from that place, let me go out into my life and do good works for you. It's a tough image to wrap our heads around, that we are really seated here. So let me tell you a story that stuck with me for a long time from the, the author Brennan Manning tells this story. He says, says that there was a woman in a small village and she was having visions of Jesus. And the bishop of that area heard that this woman had been having visions of Jesus and, and seemingly he was not okay with that. It was like, what, this woman has access to Jesus like this? And so he wants to go find out. And he says, he says, tell me, I hear that you've been having visions of Jesus. And she says, yes, I've been having visions of Jesus. And he says, hmm, well then tell me, the next time you have a vision of Jesus, here's what I want you to do. Ask Jesus the sins that I confessed the last time I was in confession. She says, okay. Some weeks go by. The bishop hears that woman in that village. She's been having visions of Jesus again. And so he goes to her and he says, I hear you've been having visions of Jesus. She says, yes, I've been having visions of Jesus. He says, did you ask Jesus what I told you to ask him? And she says, yes, I asked Jesus what you told me to ask him. And then Manning writes that the woman takes the bishop's hand in hers and she says to him, I asked Jesus what sins you confessed the last time you were in confession. And Jesus said to me, I don't remember. I choose not to remember. The psalmist will say it this way that as far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our transgressions and sins from us. I know that these two places are close on the stage. Imagine an infinite gap between them. He has removed us so far from the things that we have done and the people who we were becoming, and he has instead seated us in heavenly places with Christ. And so let me say this to you. You don't have to live like this. You don't have to carry these things around anymore. You can put them down. Because there is one seated on the throne who calls to us. You don't have to carry the weight of the world on your shoulders. I carried it. You don't have to carry all of your sins on your shoulders. I already carried those too. And the one on the throne calls to each one of us, come to me. Come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, who are being beaten down by life. And I will give you rest. We're going to end today by listening to a prayer and then listening to a song. And I invite you just to sit back and take a deep breath and listen and rest. 
listen and rest. The gospel, the good news of our King who has dealt with all of this and invited us to be seated with him. Listen and rest. Let's do that together now. Lord, you invited all who are weary to come to you for rest. Today, I come to you for that rest. I bring you the heavy burden of work, the tasks that are incomplete, the plans I want to keep thinking through, and the deadlines that are quickly approaching. I'm tempted to believe that my worth is in my accomplishments. Remind me that I am a valued child of God based on the work of Christ. And I'm tempted to believe that my security is in my possessions. Remind me of the greater and truer inheritance that is kept in heaven for me. And on this day of rest, help me to slow down calm my restless heart and anxious thoughts. And on this day of rest, help me to enjoy your creation, not as a tool for my productivity, but as a gift to delight in. And on this day of rest, above all else, help me to be aware of your presence with me. You are the one who created this world and placed me in it. And you are the one who said, it is finished. The work is complete. And you are the one who now invites me into the rest that Christ earned for me. So help me to enter that rest today. Yeah. 